This is the Wow Signal Podcast, a production of the Dream of the Open Channel. It is May 2014, and this is Season 2, Episode 2, The Great Voids, The Fermi Paradox, Part 3. Welcome. This is your host, Paul Carr. This is our third episode in which we're covering the Fermi Paradox. And in this episode, we're going to introduce physicist Daniel Carton and his new paper, Quantifying the Fermi Paradox in the Local Solar Neighborhood, a paper that just came out last month. You may have noticed a pattern here in the last couple episodes. We introduced a recent science paper. We're going to more or less continue that pattern. Not a hard and fast rule, but you will see that on most of the episodes that we present. Now, the Fermi Paradox is something you've probably heard a lot of people talking about. Here's the basic, simple essence of the Fermi Paradox. Our galaxy is very old, plenty old enough for at least one advanced civilization to have completely colonized it by now, even at speeds much, much slower than the speed of light. You don't need Star Trek type faster than light ships to make that happen. Now, completely colonized should include our solar system, our fair planet, but no one can make a persuasive case that this has happened. In fact, we just don't see any solid scientific evidence that has happened. So the simple version is, they should be here, but they aren't. This is a paradox. There have been lots of ways presented to resolve this paradox. We're going to talk about one of them today. But it's not really about the conclusions you draw from the paradox. As I wrote in the blog, the Fermi paradox should make us more humble about our understanding of how the universe works and spur us into deeper research. The great unknown is great indeed. So let's go explore. The forward path for the human adventure could not be clearer. And one of the best signposts we have is the Fermi Paradox. Sadly, this is not the only effect it has. Too many C's on the Fermi Paradox to jump to grand conclusions, not in evidence. I promise not to do that. Instead, we look for better questions than where is everybody. I haven't found one yet, but I see hope. This episode built around Daniel Carton's research, is, as I've mentioned, the third episode on the Fermi Paradox. And his research builds on what we discussed with Jeffrey Landis in episode two. More than 20 years ago, Jeffrey Landis published a paper in which he took a percolation model approach to the Fermi Paradox. Now, I'd encourage you to go back and listen to that episode and to have a look at Dr. Landis's paper from, I think it's 1991. And what Landis assumed was a fairly simple lattice of equally spaced stars, and the colonists would be colonizing inside this lattice. And he noted that some pretty well understood results of percolation theory t- will tell you whether or not the colonization process should fill the lattice or whether it should simply colonize a through a cluster of stars and then stop or, you know, eventually be surrounded by non-colonizing colonies. A lot of that depends upon the drive to colonize, how likely a particular group of colonists will be to recolonize once they've arrived at their destination. It's not clear what that drive is. There's a biological model that says that, uh, just natural selection forces life to explore every niche that's available to it, even if those niches are hard to reach. Advanced civilizations may have access to much more free energy than we do. But is it just a matter of better technology? Maybe not. 
One thing that Landis pointed out and that Carton has followed up on is that just simple physics says that you can't have a centrally controlled colonization program. It just takes too long to get signals between stars. You can't really control what your colonists do. You can send them out there. Whether they recolonize or not is going to be up to them. So it's far from certain that colonization will spread indefinitely from a given node. It depends upon this drive to colonize and also how hard it is to colonize. So what Carton did is he used a realistic star population. And the star population that we know best is the one in the solar neighborhood, hence the title of his paper. So I talked to him about his research. And if the percolation model is really a reasonable answer to the Fermi paradox, all caveats apply. Now, you're probably going to want to pause here. Go to the show notes at wowsignalpodcast.com, download the paper, print it out or bring it up on your screen, and follow along. There's only one equation in the paper. There's not a lot of math. You can ignore that equation. It's just the figures that I'd like you to look at as we go through this interview. So you do that, and we'll come back, and we'll have Dr. Daniel Carton with us. Daniel Carton is a physics instructor at the Naval Academy Preparatory School in Newport, Rhode Island. He graduated with a Ph.D. in physics from Penn State, where he worked in what is now called the Institute for Gravitation and the Cosmos. He has also obtained a master's degree from the U.S. Naval War College. His research has explored a wide array of topics, including quantum gravity and cosmology, the Lanchester Salvo equations for combat between two sides, and issues dealing with the exploration of the local solar neighborhood, which we're about to talk with him right now. He enjoys running and playing ultimate frisbee, has visited every public library in Rhode Island, and currently lives in Middletown, Rhode Island with his daughter and author wife. The reason I wanted to talk to you for the Wow Signal podcast is that I saw a post on Google Plus a couple weeks ago. I believe it was Winchell Chong, and he posted uh, quantifying the Fermi paradox in the local solar neighborhood. And I read the abstract. And I said, we have to talk to that guy <laughs> because uh, this follows up pretty nicely on uh, Jeffrey Landis's much earlier paper, right? which I think came out in 1990. Um, we talked to Dr. Landis last year, so uh, this would be a good follow-up. Your paper talks about the local solar neighborhood, which is about 40 parsecs from the sun, which is for those not used to parsecs, that's about 130 light years right. or about, let's see, what did I get? 770 trillion miles. Uh, if you like, I, I never you, think in those terms, so uh, no astronomer does, but yeah, uh, just to give people an idea of that, that's it's a very large number on a human scale, but it's just, it's just a tiny little sliver of the galaxy, right? Now, Let's let's start by summarizing what you were trying to accomplish in this. Uh, well, as you mentioned, um, Jeffrey Landis had a paper, uh, I guess, what, about 20 years ago, more or less, um, looking at a very simple model of interstellar colonization. In other words, the idea was is that a, a civilization starts at one particular star, and then with a certain probability, it'll start colonizing its neighbors. And then this process will continue on if the probabilities work out. What I wanted to do was look at more realistic data in, in the sense of we know for at least the stars close to us, we have exact positions of, well, more or less, of actual stars. And so let's see what happens. Because Landis, when he did his, um, he actually had a cubic lattice. In other words, every single star has six neighbors. And so you just go from there. So... I'm looking more at the the sense of the what is the geography of the the local solar neighborhood and how does that affect how an imaginary interstellar civilization would grow as it progressed through this neighborhood. Right now, re the reason for the solar neighborhood that you picked was that th though that's a very well characterized census of stars, and is also yes. we know the distances pretty well. Is that correct? Yes, and we know what kind of stars they are too. Right, so we can we can actually divide up. 
this is one thing that Landis did is he actually said, okay, let's actually distribute between the, the brighter stars and the dimmer stars. Um, and he only picked the bright stars. He picked the ones that are most like our sun. Mm-hmm. But I, I said, well, let's actually look at both of those, look at all stars and then just look at the brights and see, does that make a difference? Right. Now in that neighborhood of, of 40 parsecs, so 130 light years or so, I think there's a there's about what 2200 bright stars and is and that right about I think it's about 5200 total yeah 5200 total so there's a lot of dimmer stars but we right. we may not have got all of them we may not know all of them yet you, right. you point out that the the dim stars don't scale like you'd expect uh so like r to the cube so that maybe there's a lot there's a few missing mm-hmm. those are the ones we know about and and in fact you know you'll actually if you you know, within the last year or two, we've actually discovered, you know, there'll be things like we've discovered um, a pair of brown dwarfs that are within, you know, I think it's like six of discovering the dimmer um, residents of our solar neighborhood, which is kind of interesting. Yes. Now, you you modeled this colonization process uh, and you use, you picked two parameters, uh, which you call P and D max. Could you explain mm-hmm. to us what those parameters mean in terms of colonization of other star systems? Well, so P is a probability that uh, a, a given system, if it's already been colonized, that that system itself will colonize its neighbor. And the idea is, is that each time that it colonizes, it has to, you know, within a certain probability. So say, you know, a particular star has five neighbors, each of those five neighbors, it has to, it will colonize with a certain percentage. So if it's probability of 30%, you know, maybe it'll only colonize two or three. It won't colonize all five. So that's that's the the one thing is that, and and this is more of um, a, a sociological parameter. In other words, how much gumption does a particular system have to colonize its neighbors? Um, is it going to colonize all of them? Is it very gung ho about these things? Is it going to colonize only one or two? Um, does it find particular neighbors appealing? Right? Is it something like? For us, you know, we, we find Alpha Centauri appealing just because one of its stars, at least, is very much like our sun. But we might not find something like Barnard Star very appealing because it's, you know, a, a dimmer red dwarf. Um, so that's the idea behind P is that what is the, the chance that a given system will be colonized if it has a neighbor that's already been colonized? Right. And D-Max is, uh, is completely different, right? That Right. That's more of the the technological um, aspect in the sense that, you know, if we start off colonizing from our own solar system, um, how far can we get with reasonable expectation of arriving there safely? You know, is it a couple of light years or do we have more advanced technology in the sense of faster spaceships or better suspended animation or whatever it takes to get to that other systems? Are we going to be able to colonize, you know, systems within a couple of light years? Are we going to have, you know, more more range. And so that's what that DMAX is trying to quantize is how far can we get in these colonization efforts. Okay. I don't think I want to go into the, your simulation method too deeply. Uh, right. We just sort of maybe summarize what, what you did to, to do the simulation. Well, the idea is, is that um, there's actually um, some previous work in percolation theory, which is the method that I used um, and basically, the idea is, is to kind of try to simulate all possible things at once. In other words, in, instead of just saying, okay, let's let's imagine that we have a system that starts here and then it colonizes this neighbor, and that would be one computer run, and then try it again with a second system, and then just do this randomly over and over, um, the idea was that we could kind of do all of them at once um, using a particular method. Um, and so it just, it's it's... It gives you the freedom to kind of look at all possible probabilities without overloading your computer or, or waiting 10 years to get the result. So the result we're looking for really is kind of the size of the the clusters of colonies that, that result, right? Right. And whether right. or not the sun is likely to be in any of those clusters. Yes. Because you know, that, that's the Fermi paradox. We haven't seen colonists. We, we don't have any evidence of colonists. so. We right. we wonder why that might be. There's a there's many many proposed solutions to that problem, yes. uh, ranging from the exotic to the mundane. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh, so you uh, you ran the simulation just with the stars in the local solar neighborhood. Mm-hmm. 
where we have a good, as we pointed out, we have a, we know what kinds of stars there are, and we know how far away they are from each other and from from the sun. Yes. And you ended up you looked at both bright stars and all stars. Mm-hmm. Now it turns out that it looks like that both D max and P are still are very important parameters for understanding whether the the Fermi paradox is in fact a paradox, at least in mm-hmm. this simulation. Mm-hmm. All right. So let's start with uh. See, so you have figure four in your paper, which I, mm-hmm. shows the maximum cluster size. That's how big, if if you keep colonizing, how big your colon your empire grows to be. I guess. Right. Although it's not really an empire because yeah, you can't really control anything that's that's you know hundred light years away. Right. And you show it for three different ranges of of interstellar vehicle and it looks to me like if we assume that for each of these assumptions that you need you need a pretty decent chance of of colonizing in order for the sun to be in there but there seems like there, there's a point uh, at each at each of those ranges for the starship uh from 2 parsecs to 3 parsecs to 4 parsecs and 4 parsecs mm-hmm. is about 13 light years i think right the, that there's a, there's a probability where suddenly it starts shooting up mm-hmm. and and then the number of stars in that empire that the, uh, that goes up and also the the likelihood that the sun is in one of those is goes up too mm-hmm. and ultimately it goes up to all the stars and the if you if you assume high enough probability it goes up to all the stars right and a large enough distance because yeah. if you don't there may be like two or three that just never get colonized because they're too far away from their neighbors. Right. The two the two parsec chart shows sort of tops out at a hundred stars or at least less right. than hundred stars. And you summarize that in the contour plot in figure five where you show uh we need to get we need to have somewhere in the ballpark of a four to five parsec range to really make sure that the colony continues to grow. Is that mm-hmm. yeah. Because assuming that, I mean, unless there's just some incredible drive towards continuing to recolonize. That. Yeah. Thing is just that, you know, we, we've we never done it and we've never found out anybody else who's done it. So we really don't know what the probability is. Mm-hmm. So that's one reason why I wanted to show what happens for all of them, because it may be that there's some civilization out there that's really gung ho about it that puts in all their efforts. And so they have a high probability or, right. you know, conversely, you know, is is it possible to have some kind of interstellar civilization where they don't really care all that much, but they just kind of occasionally colonize, but yet they still have you know tens or hundreds of stars because of they've done it so long. So this is, I mean, I think we should caution against taking anything like this at face value. There's you have to make a lot of assumptions. Oh, definitely. But it, I think it gives us an. Given that you're using realistic distances and and so on, it gives us an interesting tool for for understanding the Fermi paradox better. I think, it's essentially, yeah. saying either a, a big colonization drive or really long range starships are what you need to make that happen. Right, and it's it's kind of interesting that one of the things that comes out is just how I don't want to say isolated, but we're not we're not exactly the solar system isn't exactly on the beaten path that there's there's a possibility that you can have quite substantial colonization efforts and just for whatever reason, they never come across us just because we're kind of out of the, the prominent ways of going. So that's one thing that was interesting to me is just that it's, it's, you know, because you actually take into account the geography of the solar system and where it is relative to all the other stars, you just get this huge gap. Well, maybe not huge is the right word, but you get this gap between probabilities or distances or however you want to look at it. Right. Yeah. I guess figure seven is probably the best figure to look at. If people are reading, going to look at the paper, they, right. There's, there's the line there that shows one, which is, that's basically us being alone. Right. Mm -hmm. And all the space underneath that is us being alone Mm -hmm. and uh, at least not colonized and every, and you can, and the reader can go see for themselves, even with a, a long range starship, you have to have a pretty good, a pretty good probability of not only colonizing, but recolonizing, right? I mean, it's the, it's the colonists that go to a neighbor star. Then they decide to go beyond that to the next star. Is that right? That, that, so it's not just that somebody from the home world keeps sending out starships, right? Because then they'd have to be 
extremely long range starships. Yeah. The, the, the conclusion you reached was there, there is a potential solution to the Fermi paradox. If we given some range of parameters and this sort of shows how it would work in a real, you know, with, with a real population of stars mm-hmm. for my listeners who are probably not going to read a technical paper, mm-hmm. uh, what would what do you think they should take away from that? Yeah, so the idea is, is that especially you know the figure that you're mentioning deals with just bright stars. Right. So if we look at stars that are like the sun, and you imagine the civilization starts at one of these other star systems, um, and they have you know their choice of where they want to go, it turns out that there's for a lot of stars there's a lot of neighbors that they have that they can get to relatively easily with very small, um, you know, a couple parsecs tra- uh, spaceships. And that if you, if you imagine this, they can build up, you know, quite substantial civilizations, but they wouldn't be able to reach the solar system because they would have to jump over a gap where their spacecraft are not capable of traveling. And the idea is, is that, you know, if, if there's no impetus to go across that gap because you have all the star systems that you want, then we're just never going to be visited. I see. Well, okay, I know I know uh good scientists don't like to speculate too much, but uh no. where where do you think these parameters are are likely to fall? You talk about the probability of and, and we you know, we're uh I'm encouraging you to speculate here. <laughs> yeah. Uh I, I know you don't really know the answer, but um Yes, and none of us know the answer. In another paper, you make a case that a three or four parsec starship should be able to make almost any uh, any world reachable. Right. The science fiction notion of being able to travel hundreds or thousands of light years in a single vessel may be completely unnecessary. Yeah, and that that's actually what kind of drove me crazy about this is that if you see Star Trek or you know whatever show or novel, they just say, "All right, I have to get across the galaxy. Let's just aim straight for where I want to go." And considering how difficult we know that star travel is going to be, it seems like you would that just not what would happen. Your spaceship would be ripped to shreds by interstellar media or, you know, asteroids that you just happen to come across or all this stuff. And so there must be, you know, a more sensible way of doing it that you stop along the way just to repair yourself or just to replenish supplies. And so that's where that original idea came from. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. So if you have, if you have the capability of traveling three parsecs, you know, 10 light years and you can get to, a substantial number of star systems that I don't, I don't want to say that that's going to be enough, but you think about, right, how long it takes to travel, you know, 10 light years, if you're going not even 10% of the speed of light and how much effort and energy has to be put in, how many resources have to be put into these starships that, you know, maybe this is good enough. Maybe this is, you know, gets, gets your, you know, out into the galaxy and, that makes you happy, and that's that's it. I don't know. Yeah, uh, none of us know for sure, but uh, right. The uh, it, I mean, it, it's it's an interesting argument, though. That you know, what would be the rationale for building a a starship that could go for a hundred light years or right two hundred light years when there's plenty of way stations in between where you could stop and and uh, do repairs and so forth, and maybe even you know colonize. Exactly. Uh, so all every all the uh, a lot of these things are folded into the probability p. For example, how how likely a colony is to survive once it arrives, mm-hmm. how like how long it will survive, will it survive long enough to recolonize, and so on. Uh, mm-hmm. Time is not really a factor here. You didn't really look at how long it takes. Right. Right. I didn't want to make it too complicated, so you know, I tried to keep it as simple as possible. So yeah, I'm I'm neglecting the fact that. Time is passing as this goes through. So yeah. there have been other papers that have looked at how 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 the civilization grows in a factor of time by actually explicitly looking at the time, but I didn't do that. Right, I understand. Okay, the uh, I did have one question on the internet, but I don't think it's really relevant to your work. But uh, mm-hmm. someone someone asked uh, where you where you stand on the Drake equation. Uh, <laughs> I don't I don't think you've published anything on that, but uh, no. Uh, <laughs> So I'll, I'll leave that. I'll leave it if you want to opine on that or not. I, I yeah, yeah. Okay. I, 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 po- um, I posted your paper and said any questions for Daniel Carton and and yeah, 
They said, well, what does he think about the third and fourth term of the Drake? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Well, let me say this, because something that I didn't put in my paper, but something that's interesting to think about is coming up with a equation like the Drake equation for the Fermi paradox, because now that we can, you know, using simple models like this, we can start coming up with at least ways of parameterizing the chance of a alien starship coming into the solar system um, based on their, you know, how far they can travel and how likely they're to travel, how likely they are to build a, a star or um, a ship and get to another star system. And so we can start saying, well, you know, I know that if I, if I think of the Drake equation, I say, okay, so for this given star, you know, it's a particular spectral class. So I can say, you know, what kind of habitable zone it has, and I can say how many planets. You know, now that we have some idea of how many exoplanets there are per star, and you can kind of build all this together and get a Drake-like equation for the Fermi paradox. Yeah, I think you could do that. What I think would be terribly interesting would be sort of the a probability distribution, how probable over a given span of time it would be that colonists would arrive given given the assumptions you know right because if they if they arrive every hundred million years maybe we just would never notice it yeah uh, uh we just wouldn't you know, you know we, we haven't been here long enough if they arrive every every thousand years we probably would have noticed it yeah uh, yeah no that definitely would be interesting and, and of course then there's all the complications of of if somebody's already here, you know, would they would they come and attempt to colonize and so forth? Yeah, uh, yeah. Th those are sorts of things that are very hard to model. Uh, mm -hmm. But in fact, I think you noted in the introduction of your paper that things like recolonization uh, and and other factors like that really aren't part of the Landis model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I think also, I mean, certainly. You know, if, if I were to speculate, I could I could say things like, you know, maybe there's a, a a very large and vibrant community of aliens in the atmosphere of Jupiter, or you know, on the moons of one of its, you know, the Jovian moons that just ignore us. So just because they haven't settled or they wouldn't be interested in the Earth doesn't mean that they wouldn't be interested in some of the other environments. Yeah, you know? that that's a good point. So, so where do you think you're going to go from here? With uh, are you going to continue with this kind of uh, modeling effort or? Yeah, I would. Um, this is, you know, again, this is the local solar, solar neighborhood. So this is a very small part of the galaxy. Um, it might be interesting to look at, you know, a much larger chunk of the galaxy and to consider uh, civilizations changing what kind of civilization they are. Are they readily colonizing or are they, you know, not interested in that thing or, you know, have some kind of shift between those two things? Um, can colonies die out and then systems be recolonize, you know, all these different possibilities, I'm um, looking at it at a much larger scale because, you know, you have, you know, here, you know, the geography has been important, right? Looking at how the solar system compares, you know, how far it is away from its neighbors. You know, if you go the galaxy writ large, there's broad distribution of how stars are laid out there and they, you know, they taper off as you get to the edge and you have different likelihoods of planets. You're thinking of the uh, the rare Earth hypothesis where you have, you know, only a certain habitable zone for the actual galaxy. Um, how do those things come into play when you look at these kinds of scales? Hmm. Okay. So, uh, Anything I haven't asked you that you wish I had? I don't think so. Okay. Hopefully I, hopefully I made sense. <laughs> okay. I, I'll bet there will be questions after this comes out. <laughs> well, yeah, feel free to pass them along. Okay. So I'm going to continue to follow your work, and hopefully there will be some uh, interesting new results in the future. All right. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. All yeah. right. Have bye -bye. a good day. Bye. I'd like to thank Dr. Daniel Carton. For sharing his work with us. I have links in the show notes to his paper on the Fermi Paradox and also his 2011 paper on the maximum range of starships that you need to carry out a colonization campaign. I also have a link to the original Jeffrey Landis paper that he based his work on. Of course, I want to know what you think about all this. And there are lots of ways you can communicate with me and with other blog listeners. 
We have a community on Google+, Plus, a community on Reddit. We have the blog, uh, the uh, wowsignalpodcast.com. You can go there and comment on the show notes. You can follow me on Twitter at Paul D. Carr, and you can also circle me on Google+. Plus. I want your questions, your comments, anything you didn't feel was clear enough, anything you'd like to make clear yourself, any ideas for future guests would be one topic I'd like to hear about. If you're someone who would like to be on the podcast yourself because you're either an expert in these topics or you just have a comment that you think should be heard, let's talk about it. Let's get you on the air. What we just talked about with Dr. Carton, I hope that wasn't overly technical. I'm going to now summarize it for you just to make sure that we all are on the same page. And I would encourage you to go back over the paper, read it, and if you have any questions, uh, pass them along to me. And I, if I can't answer them, I'll get, I'll get Daniel Carton to answer them. So, in summary... What Landis did was to assume that each new colony would expand to its neighbors with a probability that he called P. P stands for probability. Using percolation theory for a regular three-dimensional lattice, we know that if P, the probability, is less than a certain critical probability, about 0.31 in his scenario, roughly two to one odds against, then the size of the empire, and that's empire in quotes, uh, will be limited and big voids will be left uncolonized. In other words, the Fermi paradox in this fairly abstract model is not really a paradox. When the probability exceeds the critical probability, the colonization process starts filling up the available lattice, and at high probabilities, all of space is filled. Sure, this is a simplified abstract model compared to what would undoubtedly be an epic drama of colonial expansion that would play out over many millennia and involve complex and risky decisions. The probability P simply encapsulates in an average way all the economic, technical factors, plus the effects of various risks such as disease, violence, critical equipment failures, and natural disasters. Carton's innovation was to separate the societal factors from technical ones by introducing a new parameter, D max. This parameter describes the maximum range of a starship. As we understand it, never having tried it ourselves, interstellar flight is hard, and flying further is harder. A collision with even a tiny dust particle in the interstellar medium can mean big trouble and possibly mission-ending damage. Getting up to interstellar speed may necessitate close flybys of intervening stars, which in itself presents risks. We talked about that with Duncan Forgan. Then there is just good old-fashioned equipment failure, fatigue, and wear out on a journey that could take hundreds or even thousands of years. The D-max parameter encapsulates all these challenges into a single variable. It's technical, not so much societal. Another clever idea Carton had was to use the known census of stars in the solar neighborhood to model the expansion of a technological civilization. In this case, we not only have good knowledge of the distances between stars, but what type of stars they are. Bright, sun-like stars or cooler, dimmer red dwarfs. Carton cut off the solar neighborhood at 40 parsecs, or about 130 light years. In this relatively small scoop of our galaxy, he ran his model. He found that for a reasonable range of parameters, the sun was not included in any cluster. And if you look on figure seven in his paper, you'll see that. So here's the takeaway quote from his conclusion. The main result of this work is to show that there is credence to the notion that the solar system is unvisited because it lies in an uncolonized cluster or void. Note Carton chooses his words carefully. There is credence. The Fermi paradox is not gone away, but this kind of study tells us that we may want to better understand the dynamics, risks, and economics of interstellar colonization before we begin making pronouncements about the deep implications of the Fermi paradox. 
We may even want to try it ourselves. I think we should. Or if there were a sympathy and choice, war, death, or sickness did lay siege to it, making it momentary as a sound, swift as a shadow, short as any dream, brief as the lightning in the collared night that in a spleen unfolds both heaven and earth, and ere a man hath power to say, Behold, the jaws of darkness to devour it up, so quick bright things come to confusion. Now I'd like to talk about one more important and interesting consideration in the Fermi Paradox, and that is, what if advanced technological civilizations like ours are simply quick, bright things. They don't last long enough to develop interstellar flight and to colonize the galaxy. Although the Fermi paradox isn't directly related to the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, this is one consideration where they have a close relationship. The last term of the Drake Equation, the famous formula used by SETI scientists to estimate the number of civilizations in the galaxy that we could communicate with, is L, the average lifetime of a technological civilization. Now, there are different ways of defining L. You could talk about the average lifetime during which a civilization uses radio or uses optical communication. But for now, we'll just use L to mean how long a given civilization has technology sophisticated enough to master electromagnetic phenomena like microwaves. I'd like to point out that Seth Shostak, our guest on episode six of season one, has written thoughtfully about L in a document that I'll have a link to in the show notes. You can go to that document, go to page 399, and you'll find Seth's article. It covers many of the key points well. I hope you'll read it. So, does the universe devour its young? Is any ecology of molecules sufficiently complex to ask, are we alone, in fact, doomed to be alone? We prefer to think not, but we must ask this question honestly. Of all the unknown terms in the Drake equation, L is the one unbounded on the upper end. So L must be much larger than our present experience base in order for us to find ET. It must be tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of years. That is longer than the time of the ancient Sumerians to the present day. Much longer. So foolishly estimating from our single incomplete sample, L is so far only a few decades And if that is as far as it gets, then technological civilizations are very rare, and perhaps not even one has survived long enough to develop an interstellar colony. I know of no reason why this should universally be so, although we observe on our own world that civilizations grow, flourish, and die. We tend to judge ourselves harshly and wonder how our current world civilization ever survived up to this point. Horrific things like the mass murders of the 20th century tend to stick in our consciousness and signs of long-term health like improvement in human lifespan or decline in violence impress us much less. Maybe we were just ridiculously lucky to make it through the Cold War. And in the wider universe, survival of the discovery of stupid tricks with heavy elements is rare. The realistic truth is we might well find a way to perpetuate and propagate our civilization, even if it means a complete transformation of our home planet, our solar system, and of ourselves. There may be a great filter that if civilization finds its way through, it is rewarded with indefinite survival. If L is really short, on the order of hundreds of years or less, then civilizations flash and fade like lightning in the Kali night, as Shakespeare said, and we would have to be really lucky to find another one during our tenure. If L is very long, 
then probably at least a few civilizations have survived long enough to colonize at least their galactic neighborhoods and win for themselves at least the possibility to outlast the star of their homeworld. This, in turn, should push L very high if it happens, and there should be someone out there who, at least in principle, we could communicate with. So, naively, there may be some critical value of L, beyond which is effectively infinite, the point at which any mature civilization will master energy and materials sufficiently to achieve lifetimes on the order of billions of years. Could L evolve in some way over time, such that the critical threshold would be crossed and the galaxy lights up with civilizations? What would cause that? One thing that could cause it is chance contact. Over billions of years, eventually two relatively short-lived civilizations may arise close enough together in time and space and may make contact more or less by accident. It needn't just be the sort of narrow-band beacon that SETI typically searches for that would be detected. They might detect each other's waste heat, traces of asteroid mining, laser communications, or radar emissions. All they really need are persistent and thorough astronomers who keep improving their instruments. But what such a contact would inspire is difficult to assess. But once contact is established in both directions, then an entirely new system exists. These slow conversations would be more than exchanges of folk songs and cookie recipes, but may well represent a type of singularity beyond which a qualitatively different sort of structure emerges. This is analogous to the human invention of writing, which gave human minds high fidelity access to many other minds, even those long dead. Somewhere out there are Humes, Euclids, Shakespeare's, Aristotle's, and Homer's, but with an even deeper reach and greater power than we can imagine. It could take thousands of years, but once such a system bootstraps, it could lead to further contacts and a long-term stability that in turn contributes to the health of its members, who may well be motivated to spread themselves, however they might be instantiated, throughout the interstellar neighborhood. It's not one civilization that survives indefinitely, but a network, a meta-civilization, a galactic club that with great patience slowly grows and could well survive for as long as the universe offers free energy. Each galaxy could have its own independent transition moment, a moment lasting centuries. It could have already happened in many galaxies and in others, perhaps our own, it has not yet happened yet, and L is still too small. Maybe our civilization will be one of the first to make contact. Perhaps the wow signal, detected by the big ear at Ohio State University on August 15, 1977, was a hint of that. Perhaps. Let's spread a thick layer of epistemic humility on our speculative cracker and admit we just don't know what L is or how it could change. But as I am fond of repeating, humility is not timidity. Let's keep looking and keep supporting our own persistent and thorough astronomers. If you have a little spare change and want to support the podcast, I'd just like to remind you, you can do so at Patreon on a per episode basis. Just go to patreon.com slash wow signal for details. It won't break the bank. Just a small amount will help. Um, If every iTunes subscriber pledged 20 cents per episode, we'd have our operational costs covered easily. If you pledge $5 per episode, 
you wealthy person, you. I'll send you a T-shirt or a coffee mug and thank you on air. And for just $1 per episode, I'll publicly thank you on air. For very large amounts to be specified later, I'll let you read your poetry to me. Coming up soon, we'll have your special Towel Day episode on Douglas Adams, released on the 25th of May, and a new episode following our thread on the future of humanity presented by Mike Mongo with futurists Heath Rezebeck and Robin Hansen. Now, if you are a science or space podcaster, this is for you. Over on Reddit, we've established a new community for science and space podcasters to provide mutual encouragement, support, and exchange of all kinds, promotional content, um, even exchange of hosts or co-hosts, uh, advice about guests, and all kinds of other things. So go on over there, there to uh, the subreddit SciPod, S-C-I-P-O-D, and we'll hope, hope to see you there. And if you're thinking of starting a science or space podcast, come on over, and we'll help you understand what it takes to get started and what what's involved. Well, that's it for this episode of The Wow Signal. Please visit the show notes at wowsignalpodcast.com for links and more information. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or your favorite podcast aggregation service such as Stitcher or Pocket Cast or Miro or many others. So you automatically get the new episode as soon as it's out. And now here's some music by Chris Cavera. This is called Level One. of season two of the wow signal podcast this episode was written and produced by paul carr with a contribution from william shakespeare all spoken content of the wow signal podcast is distributed under the creative commons attribution share alike license music was by jason robinson dj spooky sleep research facility and chris cavera All music is either Creative Commons or presented with the permission of the artist.